All right, y'all, with Super Rugby finally over, let's go into what went right, what went wrong, and perhaps what superlatives in a hypothetical Haas election could this team end up going. Let's get into it. Hello everyone and welcome back to the On The Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Believe Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Anagi Ishii, and welcome back. Again, you know, uh, I, I think I've said this enough this year that this Super Rugby season has been more or less uh, a mixture of, I guess you could say, like a flash in the pan and other innovations. Yes, it grew, but at what cost? So uh, I would love to really break down and use this as a retrospective for this week. I know this is a test week for a lot of these teams outside of South Africa who have already played Wales. We'll get into that a little bit next week in uh, what I would like to call a autumn test series special in a way. And for this week, we're going to entirely on focus on Super Rugby and the comp this year. Uh, I guess first off, I just want to say that while I most of my predictions actually didn't uh, really age as well as I'd hoped coming into this year, uh, I think a lot of it was mainly broken down into the fact of just bad coaching direction and really just a lot of distractions on and off the field. A lot of these teams really have the potential to get there, specifically the Rebels, um, if they didn't have as much distraction as they did, and Carter Gordon being the way he was. Um, he just didn't retain the future form. My other prediction was was that the Drew would make it. Yes, they kind of did, but in the end, again, discipline and really overall fitness kind of hurt them in, in the long run. Uh, the Taz was another person I had put for a quarterfinal spot even if they did this year, they probably would have got bounced out. So all intents and purposes considered, uh, perhaps it wasn't the greatest year, especially with the amount of distraction they also had as well. And just overall leachy toxic culture in that locker room. I, I really thought that the Chiefs could have made it again. Uh, I mean, they did, but again, at what cost? So when you look at the things I'm going to break down to this week and next week over what uh, happened and how they can be fixed, it's just a lot of, up and down that I really just didn't expect. I mean, I understand parody is parody, but come on now. Like you, you got to at least retain something. And unfortunately, a lot of these teams either grew too far and took too much things off or stayed the same, rested under the laurels, and then obviously everybody caught up. So being that as it may, uh, let's get into the superlatives. This is probably the easiest thing I thought of. Uh, it was definitely a very few words type of deal kind of like a hoss selection for all of those who are in america it's like you know most likely to succeed all that type of thing uh just a couple words breaking down each team regarding this year i would say for the blues uh they were very innovative this year especially through their new defense their push for putting the chunks or the four pack more involvement throughout the entirety of the field rather than focusing on the backs but I definitely put that they still had a leaching culture. Um, obviously, they come into games a little bit half cocked and, you know, they kind of just let the game flow to themselves and then come back with explosiveness later. We saw a lot of that this year with their first and third quarter probably being their best. Second and fourth were generally not the greatest, but they're still top four in the comp, which is no slouch to them. Don't get me wrong. The Blues are a very explosive team, no matter where you put them in the park. But I, I think it's just for a lack of trying that they were able to still get that fourth place spot. I think if this competition was where it should have been this year, uh, that number would have definitely been a little bit skewed lower, uh, probably towards the middle of the average of the pack. But moving on, uh, the thing we have the Chiefs, I think they're the definition of a legacy team or a legacy student coming into college. For those of you who do not know, legacy is the term that you'd use for, you know, whether it's a sports team, a frat, you know, a kid going to college, the same place as his dad, you know, maybe your brother played on, for example, the rugby team and you get to go in and you get accepted because of that, or, you know, a frat, you know, vice versa, the people vouch for you, kind of like a reference, you know, just, you, you have an easier chance of getting in. You're, you're leaving on your laurels, you know, whether it's through the old heads in the comp, uh, obviously they got some little bit of young flavor, but it's mostly led by older veterans, which is not the worst thing in the world when everything goes right. And unfortunately this year for the chiefs, a lot of things went wrong and they weren't exactly where they were supposed to have been. 
Hence why I think they got bumped out of the final in the way they did. As for the Canes, I definitely expected a lot more, uh, but they're definitely choke artists until proven otherwise in my review. Um, in that case, you know, I expected them to really make the final. They had the most explosive team in the comp. They had probably one of the best, if not the best defenses you could argue in the comp. But unfortunately, choke artistry and bad game management for all those who know is not a good time. It catches up to you. And unfortunately, it did. Uh, you got to really just, as I've always told my players, you really got to make sure that you never underestimate the opposition, never downplay who you're playing against. Because let me tell you, they won't be doing that. And if they are, they're just as dumb as you. Uh, but the Canes did not obviously take that to heart, and that's why they collapsed in certain places in the year, just for lack of game management. Perhaps they never thought themselves to be this way this fast. They definitely turned it around with Clark Laidlaw and friends, but uh, I, I just don't know. Uh, as for the Landers, I definitely see the direction, but not the timeline. Uh, what I mean by that is you, you see where they're trying to go, obviously with the death of Karnegard and Basha. Uh, that kind of hurts their development, at least on the wing. But they definitely need a set time frame i'm sure landers fans want to get back to winning ways of 2018 and don't want to be in the place where they've been for the last what six years uh they've definitely gone above they're still competing for a quarterfinal spot they did that for the last year as well but it's ended up becoming more of the same unless you can guarantee a certain time frame a lot of these guys in scope especially jamie joseph who's probably not gonna get fired uh Outside of that, you know, you had Clark DeMoody, who's technically still on the squad as a head coach. But I'm sure all of the purposes deep down, this is still a Jamie Joseph squad. And while Jamie Joseph won't get fired, DeMoody has a chance to if they don't move through. Obviously, New Zealand rugby, they have a lot of money now with the Silver Lake deal. But that still doesn't leave them with a five-year plus uh, improvement plan. I think they need to be moving a little bit faster. They need to be on a two- or three-year schedule. And if you don't meet that, you're probably going to get canned. So hoping, crossing my fingers for Demudi, and let's move on. Uh, for the Satyrs, I think I just put three words, and these three words pretty much say it. It's flip this house. Uh, you signed arguably the worst coach in the comp with Rob Penny. You brought in no 10. You put Fergus Burke on a laughing stock out of town route to get traded to Saracens for a bag of chips and a high five. You put a glorified wing at center and at fullback then you decided it was a smart idea to have jamie hannah and cody taylor allow for a sabbatical which don't get me wrong cody taylor deserved a sabbatical but jamie hannah does not deserve a captaincy ship in any regard of the way uh and on top of that you have david havili at center when in my opinion i think he did way better at 15 that's just me uh I, i'm sure don't get me wrong you expected a lot out of uh lay half penny and friends but it just wasn't enough. And having inexperienced nines outside of Hotham, who really came into his own, really didn't show a lot of, of promise. This team looked like they stepped off the gas a big time since Razor left, and I think it's apparent that they need to change this immediately. I do not see the direction that this team is going. Perhaps someone out there is smarter than I and can see this, but uh, my crystal ball says it's going to go worse from here. Uh, as for Moana, I have another three-word. Iterative, not innovative. Uh, don't get me wrong. Tano Umaga's first year, I think it was a lot better than a lot of people expected. I definitely expected him to stay in that middle of the pack realm. Don't get me wrong. He is kind of in that lower 25 to 30% range right now. I think he can get up to that middle third. He just has to move through a lot of the things. Don't get me wrong. They're still a very young team. They're basically a revolving door. They're like the drill in terms of how players get signed which way and else. But... They need to work a lot on their discipline. They need to work a lot on their fitness and especially on their defense. It's not going to be a good time for a lot of fans. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's going to be fun to see them play in Samoa and Tonga more often than not. But if you don't fix a lot of the things, you're not going to get go where these fans expect you to go. This is a proud team. They represent proud nations. They need to be uh, given the proper shot they do, given the athletes you have to get to that final. Uh, as for the Drua, I think they still need time to cook. It's you got everything else. You're just you're missing a piece. You, you maybe got to put it back in the oven for a little bit of time. It, it's just it's not a good time for any team really to experience uh, the type of turnover that they do. They're constantly moving through backs like it's candy. They definitely need to work obviously on the same things as Moana discipline and uh, just not getting gassed out. 
a lot of these games, if they're not playing at home, turn into a bloodbath, usually on the opposite end. And I think they need to bring competitive on the road rather than just at home. While Suva is a great place to be, you're not always going to be there. And I think for a majority of their games, they did play it uh, on the road rather than at home. So given that, they really need to focus on fixing what they can, and especially with the loss of McBurn, who we'll discuss in a little bit, it's going to be kind of hurtful to see where this team can go up or down. I, I think you have more of a mm, break-even lateral move type of deal going on here, unless they can fix all the things that they can, and the head coach has the option to do so. Uh, as for the Rebels, I have all flash, no substance. Uh, I, I think this goes without saying that this year the Rebels – have flown into too close to the sun and have died. It, whether it was because of the controversies off the field, as I've talked about earlier, or the lack of confidence from Carter Gordon and just lack of form. Uh, you can also say injuries, whether it was the Brad Wilkin, uh, Rob Liotta, you could say even, you know, Darby Lancaster's uh, little stint of injury, or hell, even you can say uh, Luke Ansala Cayaloto. Perhaps all of them hurt this team. Maybe Tania Lotupo was put too much as an investment and it blew up this team's ability on the front row to really play. Uh, I don't think that they really got that mold moving until about two thirds of the season gone. By that time, it was much too late. And I feel like they could have been a lot better this year. While they did show flashes towards the end, it wasn't enough, obviously. So uh, hats off to you. So it's sad to walk to you off to the sunset. But Hopefully, unlike Old Yeller, you'll come back from behind the barn and you'll be okay. Uh, as for the Taws, I have the wrong half and half. Uh, for those of you in America or like, you know, a good Arnold Palmer style drink, it, it, this was half heart, half, uh, what's a politically correct advertiser friendly term I can use? Bogusness? Malarkey. Perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, take from that what you will. You all know what I, what I want to say, but I can't say it, obviously, because this is a family-friendly show. Uh, with the Taz, you know, too much business decisions were made in the wrong way. Uh, you took away your head coach, who arguably it really wasn't his fault. Uh, you can call me an apologist all you want, but when you put your head coach as the GM and head of Pathways as well on a team that is arguably has the most talent in Australia and constantly loses it because of the fact that you have the AFL and league and a lackluster development system to you, you're not going to be doing your team much favors. And that obviously showed itself throughout this year uh, because of the lack of coaching. Really, it was just distraction after distraction after distraction. And then I ended up killing this team. So wrong half and half uh, that I wanted. Um, as for the Reds, it's almost like if for all of you who have watched Ronnie Chang, uh, for all those who don't, I suggest you do. Very funny Asian comedian, uh, works on, on The Daily Show. You know, he, he I think you, you'll find him a very interesting comedian. But as for that, uh, for all those who do know the joke, prime now. Uh, you are in a position to win now. You had the, had the entire season really uh, up for grabs, at least for the Reds. You know, you had a new coach. You had new blood coming in, you know, older guys getting cycling out like Tony Tupo, like Luke Antala Kayaloto, who honestly probably end up coming back to the Reds at this rate if he doesn't go back to Japan, crossing my fingers here. Maybe he'll go to the Taz and make my day. But that's a whole nother thing. Uh, as for the Reds, you have the opportunity to succeed. I think it just came down to your lack of options at 10. You know, have not having JOC for majority of the year, putting Tom Lina and the rest of those boys out there really hurt them i think in their development they had good flashes but like the rebels no substance behind it and uh i, I think that's definitely something that you need to improve going into next year when we talk about expectations as for the force i just put too little too late uh despite signing curtly bill when they did i think that really revitalized that offense giving him a third pivot to work with ben donaldson and friends in that center role but because he was signed in too late, I, I don't think it was able to impact a lot of the squad. Uh, this team is very old in very key places, and I, I think that needs to change. They just need to make Perth, spoiler alert for my future segment, a little bit more accommodating for younger developing players. I definitely think that they have a shot going forward, but it just was obviously with the flashes they had. Again, all flash, no substance. Uh, they just need to improve on that moving forward. As for the Brumbies, 
uh, for all those who know a little bit of motorcycles, think of it like the Honda Super Cub. You don't need to be super flashy. You just need to be enough to last. Uh, for all those who don't get it, the Honda Super Cub is basically the Honda's first motorcycle. A lot of people know it because it's basically the slower than a moped, but it's blasted throughout the years. It's the same thing. You're going to get the same dish, very consistent. And, you know, while it's not the best thing in the world, it's what you get and it'll last you forever. And that's what the Brumbies are, I think, to me as of this year. I think going over to this next segment, this is going to break down my expectations of the year, uh, whether or not they succeeded or not, and why. So for the Blues, get to the final. Uh, I obviously have that as a yes, but at what cost? Um, I would say you still have a problem with depth at 10 and center. You know, for the fact that you put Stevie P at 15 for most of the year, you had uh, injuries to Zarn Sullivan, who could have played arguably at 15 and he was looking good for some points in the season, but then to throw him out, you had Harry Plummer playing at center for most of the year before he switched to 10. It just wasn't a good time. I feel like without Bowden Barrett, they don't have that depth at 10 that I would like to see. Uh, I think they definitely could fix that as for center. I think putting Harry Plummer at center is sometimes a good idea because he's like a second pivot and also has more space to work with, but because of the 10 just kind of being offset, I think it limits Harry's ability to really manage the field and forces him to be more of an offensive unit. Uh, obviously, having Rico Yuan at 13 is a freak, but he obviously needs rest. And having AJ Lamb, who's basically a really good wing at uh, 13, has its perks because like Rico Yuan, he'll still be that dominant guy, but he won't be the same kind of dominance you will see on the wing. So I think they need to get a little bit more at that. Uh, I think their culture is still really out of whack. Uh, you know, you could say, like I said, whether or not it's coming in half cock, uh, lack of finishes, lack of starts, whatever it may be. You can find a lot of problems with this blues culture that goes back at least since I've started watching rugby in 2017 and going back longer. I'm sure there's more. Uh, they just lack that veteran culture to really come in and put up and shut up the rest of the way. Uh, don't get me wrong, they do have a lot of savvy vets. This team is basically made up of all All Blacks, or Maori All Blacks in that regard, but it, it's not carrying over for whatever reason, and I think it needs to be fixed. I, I saw a lot of development, obviously, off of that with Vern Cotter coming in, but perhaps we'll need to see more going into next year. As for the Chiefs, uh, my expectation for them this year was remain in top form for set piece and obviously win the final, and I think this was an epic failure. The Chiefs had the best window to do it this year, uh, with DMAC coming back, a lot of the boys withholding contracts, staying the course, the Crusaders are gone. You had an open window to really take the title away from the Blues. And I think they let that get away from them in many ways and forms. Uh, obviously, like I said, the team is really too old. And I don't think the academy is doing particularly well with the player development that I've seen on the pitch. Uh, they brought on, you know, outside of Wallace TD, you really can't name another young Blues player that is really come into their own they're putting daniel rona and Romeka pohimpi who are basically both centers at wings that should show you something that's not exactly the greatest uh you're a 10 spot outside of jacob having a couple of good games no one really is going to replace dmac this team is looking like the old ireland teams with johnny sexton on there when he goes down the rest of the team goes down uh this team fell off a cliff this year in terms of set piece they were the number one set piece team for i want to feel like at least the last two or three years, and your team basically fell to what I would equate to as middle to lower third of the pack. And this is absurd for a team with this much talent coming back. This team is basically the same team over the last three years. They're reloaded and ready to go, and somehow you didn't uh, pick up your check. I don't know. Uh, they didn't come in for work. Maybe they missed a couple memos. Who knows? But being that as it may, that's really what happened this year. Uh, and I think discipline is at an all-time low with the amount of cards, especially from their captains, uh, from Luke Jacobson and friends, not a good look. And they just weren't as explosive from the forward spot as I would have liked them to be. Uh, I would say they're very one-dimensional when it comes to beating teams. They have to beat them through the explosiveness of chaining in back and forward interplay. And if they can't do that, they're basically done. Uh, and they need DMAC, obviously, to play. Uh, I would say a lot of not a lot of proper second-half adjustments you know, you could tell that in the final, uh, you could see that in a lot of the games they've played. They've won based off of keeping their lead rather than holding and destroying teams. The Reds are the only occasion where they really stomped people, but that's mostly because the Reds team looked like a broken team that came into for the quarterfinal. Uh, it just wasn't a good time. Overall, I, I, I think just having a lack thereof of proper finishes, just adjusting to game plans, and uh, proper players that tend to replace the form of DMAC 
really hurt them throughout the year. So while they did get high up on the ladder, they didn't take their free cookie. This is their year, and the window is rapidly closing on them to really get this team together before a lot of these guys either retire, go to Japan in the terms of Jacobson and company, or simply want a new contract and you can't afford to bring in new players. Perhaps that's what they have to do. Call the roster a little bit. I don't know, but look in the mirror and really fix yourself, Chiefs. Uh, this is your time to shine. For the Canes, um, my expectation for them was to rebuild back to their 18 and 19 years with Bowden Barrett and really push for a playoff spot. Uh, obviously, the last couple of few years, I guess, with the Canes has not been a good time, uh, whether it's because of just bad coaching, bad interplay, you can name it, a lot of litany of things. Uh, they just weren't a good team, weren't really competitive at any point, in my personal opinion. Uh, I, I would say this is yes and no on that verdict. Yes, because of the fact that they did push for a playoff spot. In fact, they could have pushed for a final spot. Uh, but no, due to the fact that they're electric, but they run off that electricity too much. And if they can't win by just blowing out teams, they choke. And that's worrisome. Uh, Academy player development is at an all-time high. Well, I think career highs across the board. You know, having guys who were sleepers in the academy or only had a couple appearances, they came out and balled. Uh, every position really just stood up and really held their own, uh, whether it was in fantasy terms or just in the eye test. You, you really couldn't go wrong with that. I would say they definitely were playing the best title this year for best set piece and pack. Uh, I think they're going to hold that for the next couple of years, barring the Chiefs uh, getting their act together. They're probably easily the most drilled team. They're looking very physical and yet still balance that physicality with a lot of explosiveness, almost kind of similar to the Blues, but a little bit more carryover in that regard. Excuse me. Uh, I would say they're innovative at attack and defense with that single shooter cover. I think that was huge until they started to really creep up to them in second half adjustments in the quarterfinals. I think that really hurt them. As for their good improvements, uh, they had great improvements on discipline, but bad time management and bad game management. Uh, we all know what I'm talking about. If you don't, go look through the, the fixtures and you can see a lot of these games that they lost uh, were really avoidable, and that's putting it lightly. So go back, watch the games if you have Flow or you know Sky, Sky One or whatever you, you have available in your country of choice, and just watch with me and see the games that they did lose where they lost at and it's really bad uh a lot of these were really avoidable uh, they could have avoided a lot of these defeats obviously due to coming in too high maka maka for those of you who don't know it's basically just like half cock you're coming in thinking that you're going to win the game uh this is going to be a cheese fest and unfortunately it comes in bites you in the butt and you know a lot of these could come down to that a lot of these can come into the game management you pick your poison pick whichever one you feel makes you most comfortable and helps you sleep at night but that's really the canes for this year um uh, as for the Landers, and really my expectation for them is just be better than the last four years. They have not looked good really since 2018, 2019 when Ben Smith was still there. And, you know, you had Marty Banks and, and the boys. Uh, it's It's been weird. Uh, they've had flashes with Freddie Burns in, over I think, what, last year? It, it, it's just they're constantly revolving at 10. They have no real direction, I think, at center. And their backs are constantly either getting poached by other people or – uh, not developing in the way that they should, or injury, you know, with Jonah Nareki. Um, let's say their expectation was kind of met, but they need to show more over the next two to three years, again, based off that game plan, to allow for Demudi to really keep his job. Uh, I really think they achieved the most from their cast-offs, especially from the Crusaders, from the Blues, and especially from the Chiefs, and free agency, which is great, don't get me wrong, but I, I think they need to show more inventiveness from Jamie Joseph and friends to really improve their side's ability to attack on all forms. I, I think outside of the lock position and kind of Ethan DeGroote, the rest of this team is majority of meh. Uh, yeah, Carter Garden Bashup, who was a freak this year. Uh, Cam Millen was a freak off the tees when he was available. Uh, Reese Patchell, great guy with the ball in hand, but I think they need more. When JRK was doing great, don't get me wrong. Uh, obviously, I've seen the development go leaps and bounds, uh, whether with Millen, JRK, who are... All, I think, needed a little extra push. Jamie Joseph has come in there and just given them that extra oomph that I think they desperately needed to really put this team into place. I just think they need a little bit more time. Uh, forward depth outside of props is looking promising, like the locks, like I said. Uh, loose forwards is getting there. 
but I think leaning more towards the youth rather than vanguards like Billy Harmon, uh, Jermaine Ainsley, uh, just it should be a good step that they should think of and just something that I would personally look into moving forward, whether it's through Otago's academy system, uh, the Highlanders Academy pathways, perhaps looking at even at Southland's area, just really getting in a lot of these players that I think needed a home from the NPC that aren't getting the love that they deserve. As for the Satyrs, uh, I think my only real expectation was remaining conversation for a quarterfinal, at least, eh, you know, with meh play. Uh, I would love to see with relatively some players uh, and just to rebuild the expectation of Rob Penny that I didn't have coming in. Uh, for all those who don't know or live under a rock, Rob Penny is not what I would consider a quality coach. And I think it really shows itself in a lot of ways on and off the pitch with how this team has reacted. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's a couple of apologists, a couple of defenders of Penny's ability to coach, but it has not been looking good. If you take off the currently Bill Israel Falau days when he was on the Taz, it's not a good time. Uh, he doesn't seem to do good without a star or two. And he had many stars on this team. David Havili, who looked meh for a majority of the year. You had Leigh Halfpenny, who was injured. Will Jordan, injured. Uh, Scott Barrett, kind of injured. Uh, you, you could chalk it up to injuries, I guess. Uh, if, you're really, if you're really still an apologist, let it play out next year. See what happens. But it's not going to be a good time. I would say if, uh, the expectations for that was an epic failure uh, based off of hindsight 2020. A majority of the year, the team really just couldn't get out of their way, uh, especially in the red zone at the breakdown. Just too much penalties, too many cards, too many lack of finishes, knock-ons, high passes that shouldn't have been made, etc. This team was inexperienced in all the wrong places, and it showed really badly this year. And then they really lost their direction when Scott Barrett went down with injury for a majority of the year. Uh, when he was on the field, freakish. When Cody Taylor was on the field, freakish. When you put Fergus Burke on the field, freakish. Uh, rest of the guys on, on, on that squad, no, it was bad. Uh, I would say the signing of Lay Halfpenny was essentially a wash. And I think that basically screwing yourselves out of having Fergus Burke at 10 for a majority of the year when he should have really been there after he came back from injury uh, is probably why he ran out of town. Uh, I'm sure Saracens definitely gave him a good gig, but he, he, you know he'll always say, I think, the hometown discount no matter what. And play for an all black team, but ah, you lost your shot there. As for the rest, you know, McNichol, I think, was a scrub personally. Uh, for all those who know Steve Smith from football, you can call him a jag or just another guy. I think he was just another guy for majority of this year, uh, until he was slotted in as a pocket 15 or as a setback wing, allowed to really take away the space and kind of be that RTS type of role that the Blues would have liked to have had. And he did good in that those roles, but I think it was too a little too late. I think the constant rotation, whether it was at wing 10, 12, 13, and 9, really hurt the continuity of this year. I would have loved to see Hotham more often throughout the year. I, I think having uh, Willie Hines was kind of a mistake. Or having, you know, if you're not going to put in Fergus Burke, throw in Rivez Rehana, who looked pretty decent uh, for a first-year true starter in the role. Uh, definitely could have been a better shot for him. Uh, it, it, they just need more continuity at every spot. We need everyone to play together and really get that gel, and hopefully it'll improve. Outside, outside of the bright sides of Sevu, Jamie Hanna, and Quinton Strange, really wasn't a lot of big things for them in the forward pack. As for Moana, my expectations for them were to move up the ladder and really innovate with Tana. Uh, I think it was a rousing success with some pitfalls. Obviously, they've changed their narrative of being a constant losing team. Uh, they've driven off of the back of the Tongans and the Samoan fan bases playing over there. I think was huge, as I've said earlier. But I really think they need to work on a lot of things. They definitely continue to be one of the most undisciplined, if not the most undisciplined teams on the trot. And without McClutchy and Lit, uh, Christian Lili Afano playing at a high level of play, they look meh. Don't get me wrong. You have William Havili, who's okay. But I think you need more pieces around him to really help him out. And they just didn't have it. Uh, they obviously have a lot of potential with breaks and such, but they don't necessarily capitalize on scoring on those plays unless they're against like the draw, which was basically just a big 12 competition in football for all those who know of my American fans or just people that have uh, Fox and CBS in other places. Uh, I would definitely say that they do tend to fizzle out as time gets on kind of like 
the Drua. Uh, you can call them the poly version of the Drua team, but eh. uh, I would say their effort on D is their ups and downs. You know, obviously it puts a lot of explosiveness into their D, pounding bump tackles, putting people in their place, but it leads to a lot of cards and leads to a lot of overzealous work, which tends to uh, lead to a lot of players in the bin and suspended, which tended to happen a lot this year. I would definitely say they need to get some quality transfers uh, just to make a dent at a higher point moving forward. You know, there are rumors that they were trying to get a Jermaine Kano to come back. They were trying to get a Charles Pietau to come back. Uh, I don't know if they're going to ever have the budget unless take a home run uh, hometown discount for them to represent their country. I think it would be nice to maybe think about bringing in Israel Falau. Uh, depending on whether or not he pulls a Daniel Waller for all my NFL fans out there and decides to come out of pseudo retirement. I don't know if that'll work, uh, but I'm sure he'll definitely take a decent deal. I think Japan, he's running out his welcome in Japan. He's run out his welcome in Tonga. He did not do that great. Uh, you could manage to maybe, maybe finesse more players out of the MLR. I think that'll be a really good pathway for you. There's a lot of good polys in the MLR who can do some damage overseas. I would say if you're looking at one, you got Mikey Teo. I think he'd be great back there. You could throw in a litany of other dudes. Um, if you want to look at my MLR uh, team of the year for the last couple of years, a lot of players you could definitely throw in there. Uh, but it's, it's just, uh, I, I would consider this if you know, uh, think of your closest flyaway city in any country. I think for US, at least specifically on the West Coast, it's San Diego. Uh, you're not here for long. You're probably here on a layover and you're probably going to go. That's just like the MLR for the rest of the leagues around the world. And I think Moana is that place for it as well. They're constantly revolving on a revolving door and they need to fix that immediately, kind of retain more players in house to really see constant development and succeed at a high point. Uh, as for the Taz, uh, my expectation was continue to compete for the quarters with the hope of a semi. And my <laughs> notes for this were. Uh, take it from where you can. Blackhawk down levels of bad. For all those who didn't read the book or watch the movie, that's bad. Very, very bad. Um, there are too many players taking advantage of the leverage they had in a wrong way, whether it was DC being the GM and the head coach, lack of uh, developmental pathways, coaches constantly being pulled in opposite directions, the money issue that they've had over the last couple of years, name one, they probably had a, an excuse to do something terrible. Uh, they obviously had the same roster as last year and really couldn't make it work despite having great additions like Fergus Lee Warner and friends. Uh, and seemingly without Donaldson, they looked lost. I mean, don't get me wrong. Ed Ben's a freak. I love seeing him. Don't get me wrong. I uh, also love, love, love a lot of those guys in the backfield. Mark Nwani Tawase could have used a lot of working to do mentally but that's a whole nother story this team was loaded through and through to really put a high clip level of film and roll into a semi and they failed because of that i would say mark was another jag he's another scrub uh i don't th when he wasn't getting fed when he wasn't allowed to kick the ball and play a little bit of league that's why he's abandoning them and you are a zero for that for the reasons that you gave uh he had almost Randy Moss levels from the Titans and the Raiders of just, I would say, inability or lack thereof of effort. Tons of his decisions, whether or not chasing after players, not making good tackles, uh, not making good passes, really not holding your width, bad play off the ball and defense and on the breakdown. Just, oh, I, I can just name a lot of things for that. Uh, I think the injuries, the Holloway and friends really cut down their production. Really, I think the locks from the Taz were really what kept this team going with Ang Angus Bell being hurt for a majority of the year. Uh, the locks really helped in. They really put in a, a point, especially with Ned Hannigan kind of lining up as a flanker for a majority of the contest. Great guy in terms of fantasy and in terms of the eye test. And I, I think their development has yet to be seen as we didn't obviously see a lot of good debuts this year. Um, their efforts either went half the hell or... And then a little bit of good or good and then taking the train to rock bottom. And that should show you a lot of this year. Um, as I've said once, I'll say it again. I really don't think it was really all of Darren Coleman's fault. Uh, I hope that he'll be in another head coaching role eventually in the future. But this, this was not the team, obviously, for him.
for whatever reason. Uh, as for the Rebels, uh, my expectation for them is to rebuild on last year's efforts in the quarterfinal to really contest for another quarterfinal spot and eventually, hopefully, a semi in the next year or so. Uh, I think the broken players for like Carter Gordon really helped lead them to a lackluster finish. As I've said with my superlatives, they were leaning on these guys to really kind of push the team over the hump, and it just did not go the way they want. Kevin Foot's squad uh, and the signings were sick, but they really couldn't get the best out of them, whether it was due to injuries, or it was due to confidence issues, mental health, uh, lack of effort. It was the perfect storm of hell for this team for this year, and it's not even counting the behind-the-scenes effort. Uh, obviously, like I said, Carter Gordon looked like a shell of himself, and that really hurt the team a lot. Uh, you could tell that this team lacked direction when he wasn't there. And his passing skills this year, god-awful. Somebody needs to get him to Rugby Bricks. Get him to somebody. I I, I don't know. To Get him to Quade Cooper's little, little camp that he does every summer. Something needs to be done. Maybe maybe they need to, if they didn't, spoiler alert, send him to League. Uh, you could have sent him to France to pull the Lola Sio, and he would have came out a lot better of a player. I, I, give him an internship somewhere, man. I don't know. You can't be letting guys like this go. But I, I, I'm going to go on a tirade for that for an hour, so let's not do that. Uh, I obviously would have a great effort, I would say, throughout the entirety of the year on D, but it just gasses them out and ends up hurting them. I would say the movement of Kellaway hurt the team's edge explosiveness just because he was constantly moving from 15 to 14 to sometimes a pseudo-10, pseudo-12, then back to 15. And especially with Lockie Anderson kind of staying in that same spot and constantly being hurt with Darby Lancaster, it, it just they lacked explosiveness just because of the constant mess ups in that regard. Uh, I would say once the forwards are gassed, this team was shot. Uh, whether it was on defense, they lived off of that. Uh, on offense, really, they would not push the ball forward. Sam Talakai, at his age, should not be running a full 80. Something is wrong. He should not even be running a full 40. No, 60. Uh, Maybe a 40 is fine, but come on now. We, like, like, you sign big-name players to do big-name things. You sign former Springboks on this roster that can play ball, and you still manage to really mess that up. I don't understand what's going on with you. Moving on to the other team in R, uh, the Reds. I would say my expectation for them this year was to regain their pedigree under the old Brad Thorne uh, mold and really just complete for a deep playoff run. I would say for the most of this part of this year, they had no real form of physicality to present, and therefore this was an epic fail. Because while he did make it to a quarterfinal, he didn't really do much. Um, I would say this team seemed to flow behind whether or not their backs really had it down, uh, whether it's through Lina, whether it's through Jock Campbell. If they weren't getting explosive plays out there or Jordan Pataya being there, it wasn't a good time. The team lacked overall, I think, muscle to really push things over. And I think Tate's McDermott's departure for its suspension really hurt them in that regard. Uh, also, um, I would say they're like the Chiefs. They're probably one of the biggest collapses on the trot, not named the Taws, when it comes to forward presence and just overall effort. Moving on, we'll hit Brisbane a little bit, keep a little bit close uh, with the Brumbies. Uh, obviously, there's not a lot of expectations that you really can't get outside of a semis or possible final spot properly represent Australia you are technically speaking the incumbent best team there and they really should have kept that in perspective kind of did kind of didn't so we'll give them partial credit they did not look similar to what they used to uh I think the team seemed over dependent on their back three and obviously the lack of forward uh effort and performance especially through physics and Lola Seals involvement with ball and hand in the pocket really hurt their margins of victory whether it was him not being able to probe with the ball enough, uh, feed off of the pocket and kind of play with the back three in the centers. Excuse me, using kicking skills really hurt, and their forward presence got really gassed out towards the end, which is why you'll see in a later episode what I think they should do with youth. Um, and if done in a conference system, I would say Australia would be a group of five nation or a Big 12 nation in terms of American football. Uh, and against New Zealand teams, they kind of survived off of either blatant uh what's the word misguided efforts uh, advertiser friendly term or uh luck i guess you, you could also say that uh i, I just once their forwards got gas it seems a little bit too ill-disciplined and frantic play it just really hurt them whether it was in their own end zone in the middle of the field to set up great line of opportunities on the five meter line 5022s you name it they were all there and this team did not look good uh, if Tom Wright, Corey Toole, 
Andy Muirhead weren't scoring a couple clips a game. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Perth. Let's go south a little bit, southwest. Uh, I would say my expectation was move up from the bottom of the ladder and retain it closer to the middle rank. Uh, possibly complete for quarterfinal. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I would say on my report card for that, they almost got it, but they collapsed so far as they rose. So partial credit. They looked really good for portions. They looked really bad for majority of the year. Uh, so I don't think I can even give that partial. Maybe like a 30%. We'll give you like a F minus if that even exists. We'll take that. Uh, I think this team was very frantic and just overall like just direction in general, uh, whether it was the force just running it straight, not really with a lot of good line presence, or even just constantly having to rely on uh, Donaldson, the pivots play to really set up the wing. It seemed very hands on the line, just very basic coaching. And I didn't really like that at all. I think the old heads are becoming way too prevalent in this lineup to rely on success for this team. So they need to, possibly to look for a popular youthful direction. And uh, I guess my big comparison to this would be like olive oil in a pan fry. Now, for all those who don't know and are avid cooks, olive oil has a high smoke point. So you're not going to last a little bit long with the, uh, with the olive oil if you're doing a pan fry, whether it's a steak, you know, whether it's pasta, you know, maybe making some fried noodles. I don't know. But it's going to taste good until you burn it and throw off your smoke alarms. So in this team is the olive oil with the smoke alarm. As for the drill, let's move a little bit to Suva. Um, I would say they retain their castle and fan engagement continue to fight for a semi spot was my expectation for this year. While they didn't make it to a semi, uh, they did get partial credit for holding the house down. Uh, they did good jobs with their explosiveness and their fan engrossment. I think that's obviously a big thing for them to keep going. Uh, I think losing McBurn to a ref like Glenn Jackson is an interesting switch. I've never seen the, uh, someone hire a ref off the pitch to become your head coach. But given that he has exp um, experience not only as a rugby player, uh, extensive experience with the international side who just had a great season in the World Cup, uh, needs to be, you know, put out there. I don't think it's getting as much love as it should. But I think they need results with their contract. Now, for the press release, it says a three-year contract. Don't get me wrong. That's probably true. But what most people don't know is that that normally means a two-year contract with a third-year option that they can renew or not renew. So unless Glenn Jackson can put in a magical effort within the next two years and get them a semi, I don't know if they're going to keep them. And that's a little sad. So here's to hoping that Glenn Jackson will fix their discipline issues and structured play. Please, please, you'll benefit the international side greatly. And also, maybe retain some players. But outside of that, um, I really love the development in this side, especially with their debut players. But obviously, they need to get more quality players, especially through the centers in free agency. They constantly are at a re uh, revolving door in that regard, especially in the back three as well. Um, they just need to roll the Korean bring trucks. Uh, for all that don't know politics or just don't watch anything about visiting Fiji like I do, I go down some rabbit holes when I want to travel. But, you know, broke boy got to be a broke boy. Uh Fiji is technically owned by Korean cultists. It's kind of weird. Uh, no one's really going to really acknowledge that, but you can look it up. They're all over the internet and especially all over reputable newspapers. And it's surprising how deep they are uh, embedded into the Fijian culture and overall Fijian economy. They basically own the government. It's kind of like the cartel in Mexico, but in a nice, much nicer, weirder, culty way. Uh, Take that for what you will, but if they can roll in the Korean Jesus, you know, bring truck in there, I think we'll be okay. And uh, I, I just think that there's a lot of improvement that this team needs to fix. But if they do right, they do right. If not, I would say it has the biggest ceiling and the lowest floor. So let's just see where this goes. But given that we're at almost 45 minutes, roughly on the clip, uh, let's cut this out. I'll share the rest with next week where we'll be going over really the test series recaps for every a test game that I have possibly am able to watch or at least watch highlights of specifically you rugby pass TV for not even having the U S rights for covering England versus Japan. I think that's terrible of you. You really should have fixed that uh, for me to only watch five minute highlights online is pretty heinous. Um, maybe we'll go into super rugby a little bit more with South Africa. We'll go into a little bit of what Japan can do and what I would like to see for next year. But given that, it's going to be about an hour tirade, so I'll cut it off here. That's going to be it for me, guys, this week. Thank you guys for tuning in. Peace.